dung beetle. I was born inside a ball of poo. That might sound shocking, but it's true. I ate the poo and grew and grew, just like I was supposed to do. I listened to what my parents said, their lessons bounced around my head. Forget the beauty and instead push balls of poo until you're dead. For he who, unafraid to fall, rolls the biggest ball of all, can mount his poo ball standing tall, and smile as suitors come to call. When sweet eggs hatch inside your turd, and laughing children join our herd, you'll certainly feel reassured that your hard work was not absurd. I considered it my destiny, and worked unhappy and unfree. I lived a life of drudgery, until the day it dawned on me. I don't have to live in blue, that might sound shocking, but it's true. So I left my life, and flew, and flew, and as luck would have it, I found you. The Cactus and the Spider On the side of a hill, a tall cactus grew, with agaves and aloes and prickly pears too. He stood strong and tall with his arms in the air, and loved his long life lived forever right there. His body was covered with sharp white spines, one of our planet's favorite designs to protect living beings who carry their water in places where nowhere is drier or hotter. During dark, moonless nights, he'd look up at the stars and pity the paths of Venus and Mars. The planets, they're called, which means to wander. How sad that must be, he'd often ponder. Then he would gaze at the star that stood still, and the joy of its light would strengthen his will. Its stillness was the sky's foundation, from his perspective on creation. One night, a small spider looked up at that star while searching for places exciting and far. Her home was whatever was under her feet, and her friends were whomever she happened to meet. She rolled herself up into a tight ball, then facing Polaris, she let herself fall. She tumbled and spiraled into the night, full of excitement and vivid delight. The world seemed so brimming with beautiful things that all she would wish for would be to have wings, to soar with the birds who crossed the ocean, living their lives in constant motion. Round and round and round she spun, getting quite dizzy but having such fun, until, that is, she hit a green wall, a sturdy cactus strong and tall. Looking around her, she yelled, yikes, for she'd landed between three very sharp spikes. Phew, she thought, it must be my day, but now that I'm here, I might as well stay. Hello, Mr. Cactus, how do you do? You don't mind if I sit by your side, do you? Certainly not, I could use a good chat, that is, if you have time for that. You seem to be in quite a hurry. If you soon decide to leave, don't worry. I, for one, will be standing right here when you circle around the biosphere. I suppose you've never left this spot. I know you can't choose, but isn't it hot? I have my ways of keeping cool, though patience is my golden rule. At night the problem is the cold, which seems to bite harder as I grow old. But year after year I stay happy right here. I live without trouble or strife or fear. I know that our planet is full of glories, I've listened to thousands of fabulous stories, but if you waited with me, you'd soon see it's true that if you stay still, the world comes to you. Being a spider, I thought you would know how to profit from patience and grow. Most of the spiders whom I've met told me they're happiest minding a net. They sway in the breeze like blades of grass, doing nothing as their sad lives pass, with minds as silent as they are still, waiting and waiting to eat their fill. And what's so wrong with the silent mind? It's the goal of the wisest, I think you'd find. 
They know life's wonders are calm and deep. Don't pity those who seem asleep. But surely we should live awake, and surely we should not mistake dullness with the great divine, nor stillness with a holy sign. Perhaps someday I'll settle down and spin a web in some old town, but for now I choose to roam, the endless road I'll make my home. I've met many travelers just like you, pitying plants for the things we do, like standing out in the open sun. Well, it's clearly not for everyone. But long ago I learned the notion that everything's in constant motion, and anyway we're all connected. The totality must be respected. But if you really want to see how the world appears to me, then have a taste of my sweet drink and forget the way you used to think. On the cactus's nearest spine, a droplet formed, clear and fine. The spider sipped the heavy drop until the cactus said to stop. Be careful not to drink too much unless you want to lose all touch with the pillars of rational thought, namely what is and what is not. As the cactus said those words, they left his mouth as mighty birds that flew into the cobalt sky above the clouds above so high. They joined the stars that shone that night, trillions of fires of brilliant light, and she began to feel, if not understand, the oneness of the desert and sand, the unity of space and time, awareness in its infant prime, the empty void behind her eyes, the vultures circling in the skies. She suddenly decided to spin a web as logic and reason continued to ebb into seas of chaos and contradiction, where every thought was a form of fiction. She spun a depiction of her mind with no beginning or end to find, but everything interlocking and connected, with nothing redacted or rejected. The web had parts and yet was one, expressing how reason comes undone, for logic dictates that X is not Y, and we extrapolate that land is not sky. We explain our experiences in words and distinguish the songs of whales and birds, but to the philosopher's frustration, we conflate the music with its notation. She spun freely and without compunction, spinning a web without practical function. It was neither to hunt nor to help her survive, but merely to celebrate being alive. Merely, she thought, like we need to excuse enjoying our lives and always refuse indulging ourselves in impractical ways and stopping to paint the walls of the maze. She spun above and below and in front and behind, creating a structure that seemed unrefined in comparison with the symmetrical spirals expected of the typical designs she'd always rejected. She found she was spinning the universe anew, with versions in silk of me and you, and sculptures of all that has been or will be, depicted quite clearly for all to see. In that web I was once a child, and the look in your eyes was free and wild. We stumbled upon the spider and the cactus on our way home from music practice. You said, isn't that bizarre? And look, there's a spider, black as tar. She's working frantically, practically berserk, completely invested in her great work. It's not designed to catch a fly or anything else that's passing by. Instead, it speaks to my aching heart as much as any work of art. And the more I looked, the more I saw, until I was overcome with awe by its depiction of order and void, and distinction both expressed and destroyed. I saw the spiral falling stars, the radiations of pulsars, and I saw the same within the universe beneath my skin. And then I felt the unity, how I am you, and you are me, and we are everything we see, and always absolutely free. We were rebellious and uncouth in those flowering days of youth. So we uprooted the cactus from its ground to show the world the wonder we'd found. set off on a global tour from Istanbul to Baltimore, and all the while the spider spun, which fascinated everyone. Scientists observed in their white coats, scribbling nonsense in their notes, though none of them could quite agree what they thought that we should see. The clerics, in their cashmere cloaks, claim that the web clearly invokes the love and miracle of our god, though why god chose a spider seemed quite odd. Eventually we found the cactus a home in the botanical gardens of Rome, and when one day the spider stopped working, she looked up and saw the cactus smirking. 
Where in the world are we now? Have you learned to move somehow? And how long have I been at play in inner world so far away? From the viewpoint of my eyes, fifty moons have graced our skies, and while we moved you worked in place with a beaming smile on your face. I remember it like a fading dream, a memory of a musical theme. My spirit looked through me and learned like a book that's had its pages turned. When I think of the splendors I've seen, I now know exactly what you mean when you say one can travel without leaving home, an explorer doesn't have to roam. For my part, I'm afraid I must confess that I love the world much more, not less, for traveling across its lands and seas, I took to travel with joy and ease. We passed through forests, fields and mountains, windmills, castles, palaces and fountains. In blazing sun and winter storms, I love this planet's moods and forms. I made friends of every size, some young, some bold, some old, some wise. I now know why you love to roam and call the road your happy home. But I'm also glad we've settled down in the garden of this town, where I can watch the stars go by and ponder matters pure and high. And once again I feel my feet keen to make a quick retreat from this web that I've created, which already seems to me quite dated. So long, my dear friend, and thank you for everything. Likewise, all the best. She walks these wild woods alone, a lonesome wasp who's never flown, who's better known for her painful stings and for being a wasp that has no wings. A lush coat of hairs adorns her back, beautifully painted in scarlet and black, vibrant stripes that say, beware, approach with caution and due care. Much like how a rattlesnake might warn you of a fatal mistake, when she's threatened on her ground she strikes a strident squeaking sound. She also has a rock-hard shell and can even emit a putrid smell. In short, she's particularly hard to eat, but if you mean no harm, she's really sweet. Speaking of sweet, she's a collector of the forest's finest nectar. Nothing delights her quite like the sight of flowers shimmering in sunlight. Bluebells, daisies, rocket and thyme, primrose, pansies, dandelion and lime, jasmine, lavender and forget-me-nots could all be found in her favorite spots. She lived her life in perfect peace and joy that never seemed to cease, until one day, while on a walk, she bumped into a cicada hawk. Hello, she said in her friendly fashion. I see you share my pollen passion. Do you recommend any fields nearby? The hawk said nothing in reply. A cicada hawk is a wasp, not a bird. Quite friendly wasps, or so I've heard, but this one completely ignored our friend, and that could have easily been the end. But the velvet ant didn't accept that answer, though he twirled away like a ballet dancer. She said, I know that you can hear me. Please, you have no need to fear me. Buzz off, he said, and leave me alone. There's a reason you found me on my own, and I certainly don't intend to rant at an insect as vile as a velvet ant. I just hope to spend these morning hours sharing stories, love, and flowers. I may have a sting like a burning knife, but I've never harmed a creature in my life. Do you not know your eggshell cracked in a hawk's nest that your mother attacked? You hatched, and then you started to feed on defenseless larvae with insatiable greed. You are right about my mother's raid, but I can't help where I was laid. It wasn't my choice to eat your kind, I did that before I formed this mind. But since the day I've been this shape, I've done all I possibly could to escape the horror I woke to in that nest, and that history of violence I detest. 
You presume I'll choose to act like other velvets, but in fact I'm searching for a peaceful way to raise wasps without needing prey. Well, isn't that just fine and dandy as you sit there slurping candy, but the truth is that you're only here because of that past of murder and fear. Just then, from behind a nearby stem, a cicada called out to both of them. Excuse me, may I share my story? Though I'm sad to say, it does get gory. We cicadas escaped the killing trap. From egg to adult, we only eat sap. And since we just eat what we need, the trees don't mind the way we feed. So, velvet ant, do not despair. Keep your dreams, you might get there. As for the hawk from where I sit, all I see is a hypocrite. Don't you know the price the cicada paid in the chamber where your egg was laid? Your mother paralyzed one for you to devour, and you ate it alive, hour by hour. I've known cicadas that's happened to, but that doesn't stop me from talking to you, for we'll never find peace in the lives that we live if we don't have the love in our hearts to forgive. Farewell, he said as he took to the sky. In silence, the wasps watched him lazily fly. The hawk then turned to the velvet ant and asked, So, what's your favorite plant? As they met each other's eyes, in this world where everything dies, they realized what matters most in the end is to look at the other and see a friend. Servants kept me safe and clean, and as a princess of my brood, I was fed the finest food. So I grew healthy, strong, and proud, and looked down on the common crowd. For I was born for better things, I was born with golden wings. Not for me was endless toil, nor a life lived under soil. I was born to take the sky and rule this world from up on high. With my wings I soared in joy, and all the world was but my toy, when dancing on a silver cloud I met a prince both strong and proud. We lost ourselves in wild dreams of meadows, flowers, lakes, and streams, but when my noble lover died, oh what heavy tears I cried. In the darkness of that night I lost my love of life and flight, I grew too heavy for the air. I lost my wings and didn't care. All I wanted was to sleep somewhere safe and dark and deep. So in the softest earth I found, I dug a hole into the ground. To ease the weight upon my legs, I started laying tiny eggs. And from those eggs, my first brood grew and formed themselves into a crew. They're building marvels out of soil in honor of my noble toil. But trapped inside this guarded hall, I feel helpless, weak, and small. All I do is eat and lay, so far from the light of day, far too big to leave this hole, so far from my youthful goal.
wasp. I woke up one day with a stretch and a yawn while sparrows were singing their songs for the dawn. I picked up the paper and what did I see? Pictures of bee after bee after bee. The front page read, the honey festival's here, bigger and better than ever this year. Come one, come all, by wings or six feet. Come to our fair for a magical treat. I was the happiest ant in my colony as I read in the warmth of my hollowed out tree. My compound eyes grew in anticipation of all that was new in honey creation. I perused the reviews of the awful and great, of what I should love and what I should hate. This year's eucalypti were fragrant and smooth, but the orange blossoms, bitter and uncouth. All the reviewers agreed on the best. Bartleby's viper's bugloss surpassed the rest. They waxed lyrical about this honey of worth and likened the flavor to spring's rebirth. How like the valley where its flowers grew, how like the beauty of its blossoms blue, as delicate as winter's last snowflake, yet deep as the depths of an ancient lake. These raving reviews caught my keen eye. Bartleby's honey was something to try. It was then that I read on the very last page expressions of anger, disgust, and outrage. This year's festival featured many a first, but of all the changes, one was deemed worst. The bee critic certainly didn't find it funny to be joined at the fair by a wasp who made honey. What do the wasps know of our art? They'd rather be feasting on us for a start. The differences are plain to see between spindly wasp and glorious bee. Their vulgar behavior is aggressive and rash. They wear black and yellow but eat from the trash. Surely it's against all decency and taste, and taking the place of a bee, what a waste. First they invited the bumblebees, who'd rather live in the ground than the trees, but I thought it happened to be a pack of lies when I heard of a wasp competing for the prize. The wasp was allowed, despite the vexation, albeit with the following stipulation. She'd be permitted to share her work's yield, so long as she set up in a separate field. Being an ant, I felt deeply connected to a winged cousin of mine being rejected. As if Bartleby's bugloss wasn't enough, I couldn't miss out on this wasp's stuff. So, after my morning shift shifting rocks, I walked far beyond the dandelion clocks, and, retracing the well-worn steps of the tour, I arrived at the site at about half past four. Festival is a sight to behold, with its flowery fields and banners of gold. Insects of all kinds fill the land and the air, some humongous, some tiny, some common, some rare. The cicadas and crickets sing through the night in passionate choruses of pure delight, while the buzzy hives drone by day, a soundscape of both work and play. Everyone was there to savor the pleasure of wallowing in the bee's golden treasure, but while a wide variety brings joy to the heart, it does make it difficult to know where to start. My exuberance, perhaps, allowed me to forget about the wasp who'd stirred up such upset, so I first opted to conduct my own test. Was Bartleby's honey truly the best? I waded through hundreds of thousands of bugs and even pushed past a flotilla of slugs, but when I finally reached the end of the queue, Bartleby's kitchen was nowhere in view. This can't be for Bartleby, I began to fear, but then saw the sign, five hours from here. Together with earwigs, termites, and crickets, I patiently waited beside the thickets. Just as I neared my delectable prize, the sky darkened with a swarm of houseflies. A fly had turned and said, as flies do, You'll surely allow me a friend or two. It was said as a statement, not a request. No wonder they're always considered a pest. By the time the final fly had cut in line, I found myself back at the five-hour sign. With a rumbling tummy, I began to brood over leaving this food festival for food. I'd waited as long as I could wait and couldn't remember the last thing I ate. Weak with hunger and nauseous and pale, I scuttled off down an unmarked trail. I scoured the path for a morsel to eat, but nothing was on it besides my feet. 
How different life is in imagination, I said to myself in indignant frustration. But as the din of the festival fell out of hearing, I stumbled across a mysterious clearing. Back of the field sat a table and chair, but not a single other creature was there, except for Shirley, the wasp I'd forgotten about. Fresh honey for all, I heard her shout. I scampered up eagerly and took my seat, and within seconds was presented with a treat, a globe of amber honey perfect for suction, served with a flabbergasting introduction. You must be keen to taste Bartleby's honey. Well, try some yourself while it's warm and runny. I know for a fact it's particularly fine, because, believe it or not, the honey is mine. Before she'd spoken, I'd had my first bite, which instantly lifted me out of my plight and into a realm of pure sensation, of sweet and comforting, delicious elation. Its texture was as smooth and glossy as lava, with flavors erupting like mountains in Java. But perhaps the greatest of its powers was my feeling of oneness with its flowers. After that moment, I was back in my seat, as myself, with my memories and six fast feet. But I also recognized that in my mind, my fears and regrets were somewhere behind. First, I thanked her in a voice most tender. The last thing I wanted to do was offend her. But my curiosity got the better of me, and I heard myself ask, A wasp made this honey? She replied to my question with a gentle smile that told me she was going to speak for a while. You might as well ask how an ant can move rocks, or how a hare can outwit a fox. The fact of the matter is it's simply true that making honey is something wasps do. It's been our art for as long as the bees, though we don't advertise it from the trees. The difference is we make only what we need. In our society, there's no place for greed. And what we create, we don't call by our name. What's important to us is the art, not the fame. So when Bartleby visited us last year, I'm sure I was grinning from ear to ear. I taught her our secrets without a care, for everything we create, we share. Bartleby attempted our honey, but made a mistake. Her batch turned out bland, watery, and opaque. She'd harvested the perfect bugloss flowers, but our skills must be practiced for hours and hours. She was far too proud to become our student, so she did what I presumed she thought most prudent. While we were out harvesting, she robbed our store, a crime that never had happened before. But worst of all, she claimed the honey as her own and spoke of her genius with an arrogant tone. She said nothing at all about our craft and artistry, and that's what really broke our hearts, you see. We worked tirelessly to replace our store and worked twice as hard to do something more. We created a new honey from an Apuncha cactus using techniques unknown to common practice. I've brought this new honey here to the fair. Our entire year's harvest is here to share, except as it happens for a minuscule submission that I sent to the head of the anonymous competition. For this year's president of the jury is Bartleby, and when she tries our new honey, she'll know it's from me. But I also know by the time its flavors have unfurled, she'll have changed her views of herself and the world. When she found I'd been accepted to the fair, she acted with great caution and care to put me in a place where no one could find me, with a forest in front and a river behind me. I didn't complain or declare it a sham, for I know that she knows right where I am, and after she awards us the anonymous prize, she'll fly here personally to apologize. And that's the reason I'm playing this game, to give her a chance to atone for her shame. But I've spoken too much to my only guest. Please try the honey, I think is our best. She gave me a globe, as red as the fire of a phoenix reborn from its funeral pyre. Moments after the honey swirled in my mouth, I lost my sense of north and south, of rightness and wrongness and goodness and badness, of hope and regret and of happiness and sadness. My being was flooded with a timeless love, indistinct yet with a strange notion above of a singularity at the heart of it all an absent point from which we have fallen into it.
I looked at the wasp but had nothing to say, for what could I do that would ever repay the passion and love that she freely shared with a humble joy that can't be compared? My tears must have spoken on my behalf, for she waved me goodbye with a hug and a laugh, along with some honey to take to my home, or anywhere else I might happen to roam. I woke up one day with a stretch and a yawn while sparrows were singing their songs for the dawn. I picked up the paper and what did I see? Pictures of bee after wasp after bee. The wasps had, of course, won the anonymous prize, and Bartleby did more than apologize. She publicly confessed her treacherous crime and announced her apprenticeship at the same time. Nowadays it's a fact known here and beyond from mountain to valley to river to pond that bee honey is abundant, sweet, and fine, but wasp honey was first to reach the divine. Tick, questing on a blade of grass, waiting for a host to pass, reaching with two outstretched limbs, day by day my spirit dims. Now a lake comes walking by and just like that I'm on a thigh, once again with you my dear, somehow I knew I'd find you here. I'm amazed how fat you've grown, sucking blood here on your own. Alone just like the ticks around you, how has that much blood not drowned you? You drink, you think, in gratitude, but greed seems more your attitude. I've never known a tick to burst, but who knows, you might be the first. I know that you won't stop your feeding while the beast continues bleeding, so I wonder what you're thinking when you see me here not drinking. Emaciated, close to death, surely near my final breath. You've put me off this life, my dear, so I'll be dropping out. Sparrow. One summer, a sparrow hatched in a nest, a sparrow whose life would be musically blessed. His nest had been built in a hole in a tree in a beautiful copse growing next to the sea. The surroundings were rich in both insects and seeds, and everything else a sparrow needs, namely pools of water and sand and the building materials that nests demand. His parents had hatched many clutches before, and each time they'd laid up to four but no more. Four speckled eggs colored cream and gray, which they'd look after night and day. That summer, however, they'd laid five, five sweet sparrowlings they hoped would thrive, chattering and chirping for their food and barging and jostling in a manner quite rude. His parents shared incubating the eggs, two bundles of warmth on tiny legs. They'd lined their chamber with all sorts of things like pigeon feathers, hairs, papers, and strings. In the light of the moon on the thirteenth night, the chicks began their birthday fight. By dawn, four chicks had hatched quite keen, except for one egg in an odd shade of green. After another night had passed, the unusual egg had hatched at last. A new sparrowling doesn't have many choices but to join the choir of hungry voices. So he barged and he pushed and he chirped and he yapped, and with his little wings he greedily flapped. He was a day behind in strength and size, yet he managed to eat enough spiders and flies. It wasn't long before he caught up in strength and matched the others in wingspan and beak length. So when the nest began feeling like one feathered mass, he hopped out of the tree and onto the grass. He'd left the confines of his nest, the noisy bother he'd begun to detest, and found himself alone and free in a flower-filled field and very hungry. He looked all around him for something to eat, but saw nothing tasty by his feet. So he did what had always worked before, he chirped and chirped and chirped some more. His father must have heard his cry, for at that moment, out of the sky, he landed beside his starving son, but as far as food went, he had none. 
I'm not going to feed you any longer, but as it's my duty to make you stronger, I'll show you how to forage for food, to feed yourself and your future brood. First they toured the local berries and discussed how to find the ripest cherries. They then spent an hour learning shell cracking, an essential skill for sparrow snacking. While flitting between the rustling reeds, he learned about the most edible seeds, and when the day darkened to night, he learned how to use his hearing as sight. They spoke about each and every sound in the vibrant soundscape emerging around, though as his father performed his duty, our sparrow listened spellbound to the beauty. of the frogs and cause of the crows, the rasping of moles burrowing with toes, the pigeons cooing their plaintive calls, the crushing roars of distant falls, the flapping of bats above in the sky, the piercing shriek of an eagle's cry, the tinkling of a rushing stream, he listened in awe as if lost in a dream. But of all the wonderful sounds he heard, one call above others impressed our bird. It was powerful, rattling and shrill, yet fine. The sound sent a shudder up his spine. He asked his father, is that a bird? It's the loveliest sound I've ever heard. My son, he replied, that's strange of you to say, but if you like them at night, just wait until day. It's rare to hear them after dark. You should be happy as a lark, for cicadas are one of the tastiest bugs to find and easy to catch if approached from behind. But the loveliest sound you've heard, did I hear? When I'm hungry, I suppose it's music to my ear. And so they expressed their joys through song, cheerfully chirping all night long. day our sparrow returned to the site, gloriously lit by summer's light, the field where he heard the cicada's song piercing through the din of the throng. When he arrived he couldn't believe his ears, his eyes began instantly brimming with tears, for, as he was told, what a difference by day, a thousand cicadas were out at play. He sat in silence in that choir, listening to a song of fire. Some were sustaining rattling drones, while others joined in in intermittent tones. The cicadas transformed the sweltering air into a music emerging from everywhere. In that perfect expression of season, he had no need for thought or reason. Lost in his rapture, he started to sing, but soon found himself in a silent ring. Cicadas don't sing when danger is near, and a singing sparrow is something they fear. So he stopped and hid behind a tree, and as he was feeling inspired and free, he decided to imitate the sounds he heard, as best as he could, being a bird. And that's how he spent his first hot summer, creating a sound that's both singer and drummer. And as he improved his vocal technique, the ring of silence diminished each week. As the nights grew ever longer and colder, his songs grew ever stronger and bolder. But it soon became clear the cicadas were leaving, and no other bird understood his grieving. Back of the cops, he tried to fit in. He was loved and respected among his kin. He'd even found a partner and friend, a sparrow he'd stay with until his end. When he told them about his greatest pleasure, he was rather bemused by his choice of leisure, but he allowed him to be who he wanted to be as he spent his summers behind that tree. Apart from his peculiar passion, he lived many years in the sparrow fashion, until the day he met a curious crow while pecking for berries buried in snow. The crow was making strange sounds indeed as he searched for his fill of fruit and seed. He sang like a sparrow, he barked like a dog, he cried like a rooster and squealed like a hog. He made sounds our sparrow didn't even know, all without once cawing like a crow. 
So the sparrow decided to let his voice ring, and he sang what in winter only he could sing. The crow looked over with beady black eyes. My, oh my, he said, what a surprise. A sparrow that sings like a hot summer's day. Something most curious has come my way. Though I copy the birds and horses and hounds, I must confess I can't make cicada sounds. They knew right away they were birds of a feather and chatted for hours in front of the heather. The crow listened closely with a cocked ear as a sparrow shared his greatest fear. No matter how much I improve my technique, something about it remains rather weak. Although it might seem perfect to you, I know I've got more work to do, for to this day when I join in the choir, there still are cicadas who choose to retire. The crow replied, You should meet my teacher. He's a most wondrous and marvelous creature. He's like no bird you've ever met. That I assure you, I'll take any bet. He can imitate every sound he's ever heard, though he says, I'm only a liar bird. He came from an island far, far away, but quite likes it here and plans to stay. Follow, said the crow, as he flew to a cave, as somber and foreboding as any grave. must enter alone, so I'll wait right here, for he'll only meet you after testing your fear. The sparrow stepped nervously into the black. His heart was fluttering, but he didn't look back. Why am I trusting the words of a stranger and hopping headlong into deadly danger? When he passed by a pile of fresh bird bones, he began questioning the crow's friendly tones, and just at that moment, make no mistake, he heard the rasp of a rattlesnake. Though frightened, he recalled the lyrebird's power and carried on forward in that black hour. A real rattlesnake wouldn't give me warning, he'd munch me in silence and sleep till the morning. As calm overcame his illusory plight, he saw before him a remarkable sight. In the middle of a chamber spotlessly clean sat the most extraordinary bird he'd ever seen. From beak to talon, he was actually quite plain. He resembled a gray catbird in the main, but behind him extended a spectacular tail, 16 grand feathers that seduced without fail. The lyrebird asked him to sit where he wanted, to be himself and no other, uninhibited, undaunted and to reflect upon the secrets of vibration, the fundamental essence of all creation. His golden voice danced around the grotto as he concluded succinctly with his motto. Ask what it is that you think you desire, but remember, I only can speak as a liar. The sparrow quite nervously related his doubt regarding the cicadas who always drop out. Could you please listen to the sounds I make and point out the place where I make my mistake? The sparrow then sang his song for the summer, creating a sound that's both singer and drummer. While, with eyes closed, the lyrebird carefully listened, observing the sound as it jangled and glistened. In the silence that followed the last reverberation, the lyrebird maintained a look of deep concentration. Then he smiled and said, That was truly superb, yet I understand why it might, a cicada, disturb. Cicadas make sounds with membranes called timbals. For such sounds, our voices can only be symbols. No matter how passionately you practice and try, you'll never send the same vibrations through the sky. I'm reminded of something my teacher would say, play not what you want, but what you're meant to play. He meant that the sounds that we think we desire always in tune with our innermost fire. I, for one, see space in the sun, for one to sing simply for pleasure and fun. So sing with cicadas when summers come round, but in winters come here to develop your sound. Yes, said the sparrow, I can't thank you enough. I'll return when the winds grow cold and rough. The pleasure's mine, said the gentle creature. Thank you again, replied student to teacher.
The sparrow flew home with his new friend the crow, eager to live and to learn and to grow. He told everyone what the lyrebird said, filled with excitement for what lay ahead. He devoted his heart to his magical teacher, year after year sounding more like a preacher. Though, somehow, in finding his own voice and way, he'd only repeat what the liar would say. Cicada Hatch, burrow, feed, emerge like a sprouting seed, sing, mate, die, don't waste your time with why. Fill your life with sap and song, don't dwell on if it's right or wrong, for all those notions in your head are dead before they're even said. Hatch, burrow, feed, emerge like a sprouting seed, sing, mate, die, don't waste your time with why. That's the story I was sold when I believed what I was told, in the first week of my six when I was taught the games and tricks. I lost myself inside the tones of my sweet brood's ecstatic drones. Reality was all vibration, ringing, singing, celebration. Pleasure was my only measure, all that I was taught to treasure. Sing, they said, and bliss would follow. So I sang, but it felt hollow. When I'd see my friends at play and think about their dying day, I couldn't help but start to doubt that joy was all that life's about. Now three weeks have quickly passed, that's half our lives, incredibly fast. What's to come will soon be gone without us here to greet the dawn. If I'm nothing more than matter, all I am will someday scatter, washed into the endless sea of everything that ever will be. Will the I that's me then disappear, my I that feels life's joy and fear? Am I a thought that's in my head which won't exist the day I'm dead? And when did I become to be this entity that I call me? When I formed inside my mother? When I recognized another? Or was it at the very start, the first pump of the cosmic heart? Was there ever such a thing, or does time circle like a ring? You can imagine the typical dismay when instead of wanting to frolic and play, I'd question my friend's philosophical leanings and ask them about metaphysical meanings. Cicadas live as hedonists, reveling in summer trysts. When they take their final breath, most have never thought of death. I understand the point of view that life is not to think but do, but is the truth an open sight or are there secrets to the night? In search of truth, I left my kind to see what answers I could find in other corners of this land, on mountain tops and desert sand. I sought the wisest of the wise, those who know the truth from lies, and with them walked into the mist that shrouds the reasons we exist. <laughs> In a land of hills and lakes, I came across the queen of snakes. She said, Life is only pain, for even what's good is sure to wane. All we love we're doomed to lose, it's a fact we can't refuse. The more we latch onto desire, the more we feed the raging fire. The wise should detach from both pleasure and pain, and greet the sunshine like the rain. This was contrary to all I'd been taught so it took me some time to respond to the thought. Your healing logic is quite clear, but shouldn't we treasure the beauties here? 
at the core of my deepest being, I want to love the world I'm seeing. But who's that I you're talking about? The enlightened bee strained to shout. Your eye is essentially a delusion that causes you pain and endless confusion. Are you quite sure that you're not me? Ask any ant or wasp or bee and they will say that we're all one along with the rocks and plants and sun. My instincts tell me you're not me and we're not quite the things we see. My nerves create a physical border that structures an ontological order. If there's no I that's making choices, how absurd are these inner voices arguing constantly in my brain and filling me with doubt and pain? And if that's so, there's no free will and no responsibilities to fill. But, shockingly, I feel on me, and I also feel, relatively, free. That's what I told the saintly bear, who looked at me with endless care and said, Of course we both are real, and should believe in what we feel. I believe in right and wrong, we're notes inside a greater song. Although our lives are always linked, every eye is a soul distinct. Why not trust in common sense instead of creating such a stubborn defense against what feels self-evidently true that I am me and you are you? And after death comes eternity, where my loved ones wait for me. How I long for that blessed day when I shall finally pass away. I'm happy you don't live in fear, but what if all that is is here? Why live for what might never be when here we are beside the sea? I'd spent a whole week as a sleuth, but felt no closer to the truth. For once I'd hear one point of view, I'd think or be told the opposite's true. Paradox, said the oldest tree, is the nature of reality. Everything is one, and it's also divided. Your faith and reason is misguided. Language, our sole philosophical tool, is only the praying of a mule. Real understanding is something beyond us scoundrels born in a murky pond. That sounds about wrong. Thanks, kind tree. I think that I'm finally starting to see the only thing true is that truth is a lie, yet somehow we're wiser for wondering why. I then left behind existential debating and rejoined my friends in their singing and mating. It wasn't quite happily ever after, but I learned to enjoy the brief moments of laughter. Processionary. When the bees begin busily buzzing in spring, while in the bower birds boisterously sing, you might think that clouds are stuck in the trees, blown in by the wailing winds of the seas. But as you get closer, you'll grin in delight at a most marvelous magical sight of long lines of caterpillars inching along, leaving their clouds while singing a song. In this wild world of danger and doubt, we figured out what life is about. There's only one thing that you have to do. Follow, 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 follow in front of you. And if you happen to be at the front of our annual place to pupate hunt, don't feel special for being ahead. Look behind you. Realize instead that by leading your lead. The processionaries march by night and by day, despite the negative things that we say about their urticating manes of hair, which are their only defense, to be fair. They're surrounded by hungry birds who love to feast on the beasts in swoops from above, or peck them to death calmly on the ground, to say nothing of the ravenous toads that abound. 
The deadly larvae certainly don't intend to bring any creatures to a nasty end who mean them no harm as their paths cross ways along the forest floor on early April days. When it seems that in the shade of the pines all the processionaries have gathered in lines, it's hard to imagine one on its own trail without a fellow ahead or at tail. Sometimes, though rarely, an insect emerges who chooses to not sing traditional dirges, but instead decides to compose her own tune, alone in the mystical light of the moon. A solitary song, for better or worse, that some call a blessing and others a curse. While the masses merge for morning inspection, she inches away in the other direction. One such caterpillar called herself Jo, who'd hatched among thousands of siblings in snow. She feasted on pines from the day of her birth as often as could any creature on earth. Jo certainly enjoyed the company of others. She munched merrily with her sisters and brothers, but when her siblings started forming lines, she began to feel oddly alone in the pines. Although she loved the melodies they sang, when she'd sing along, she'd feel a pang, a desire to improvise something new, but nobody shared that point of view. To everyone else it seemed clear as day that forming lines was the only way, just as it was for their parents before as they marched along the forest floor. Thinking uniquely was strictly forbidden, freethinkers among them kept freethinking hidden. If you asked at random, you'd probably find the concept wouldn't have crossed their mind. In a culture where the aim of the game is to do what I do, and exactly the same, it might come across as an odd surprise that a caterpillar such as Joe could arise. Our Joe never wanted to live like the rest, though she loved all the others who'd hatched in her nest. The problem was simply she found them a bore, and what's more, she wanted to search and explore. One fine evening she made up her mind to go her own way and see what she'd find. By morning inspection just before dawn, she'd finally find herself moving on. Indeed, off she went on her own, down the tree. How easy it is, she thought, to live free, free from society's expectations and all of its numerous other frustrations. The moment Joe's first feet touched the ground, a happier animal couldn't be found. Before her lay a needled expanse, a beckoning stage for a rambler's dance. She knew in the end she'd need to find soil, a place to cocoon and sleep off her toil, a bed wherein her wings would unfurl, translucent and shining like mother of pearl. But metamorphosis seemed eons away on such a bright and beautiful day, for nothing in thought is ever as pleasant as losing yourself in the endless present. She ambled dreamlike for countless hours, drifting through rainbows of wildflowers, delighting in the varied and vibrant sensations of the pine forest's spring salutations. But she soon came across a crashing reminder of all the conformity she'd left behind her. A long line of caterpillars were on the ground, inching round and around and around and around. The first processionary was following the last. She gawked at their silly circle aghast. She watched them, without making a sound, go round and around and around and around. She knew the cause of their condition was blind obedience to tradition, though she could see a certain beauty in logic superseded by duty. For despite the fact they were marching in place, a contented look sat on each furry face. It was clear that nothing she could say would make them stop and walk away. She thought to herself, in a way they're right, to be happy together by day and by night, to march and sing heartily on little knees in cheerful company where everyone agrees. But long ago she'd made her decision to follow a path of personal vision, to explore the glories of the earth and find new soil for her rebirth. So she drifted away through patches of grass with magnificent blades as smooth as glass, and on their surface her eyes got lost among the intricate crystals of frost. Swallows tweeted their springtime tunes, while roses spread their olfactory runes. All the while in the bright open sky, pillowy clouds floated by. But soon looming into her view was an odd structure, metallic and blue. She felt a quite unexpected desire to climb the object higher and higher. When she reached a rusted hollow space, she began to regret exploring the place. 
for all that she'd seen since leaving the dirt had been ugly, foul-smelling, crude, and inert. Just then she felt a tremendous vibration that filled her with dread and trepidation, along with an earth-shattering roar that echoed across the forest floor. Neither cicadas nor a screeching bird could conjure up the sounds she heard, but strangest of all was her new notion that noise had set the world in motion. Parts of the object started turning, and it seemed like something within it was burning, but the only thing of which she was sure was that her world had become a blur. After what seemed an eternity had passed, the structure ground to a halt at last. She had to do something, she had to escape, so she jumped and landed with barely a scrape. Then, like a dragon she'd seen in a dream, the monster vanished in thick clouds of steam. She was left all alone in the frightening dark, in a vast paradise of needles and bark. She thought to herself, this looks quite good. Soft earth, stars above, and plentiful wood, with pine trees taller than I've ever seen, and tasty needles in every green. But as her eyes adjusted to the night, she realized not a single nest was in sight, and pondering that under the starlit sky, she didn't know whether to laugh or cry. She'd finally achieved her lifelong dream, the objective of anyone's life it would seem, yet, listening to a river's sweet drone, she never had felt so completely alone. Joe determined not to wallow in sorrow, nor worry about what might happen tomorrow. Instead, she dug for somewhere warm, a peaceful place where she'd transform. She buried herself deep underground, leaving behind all color and sound, and in that blackness she wove her cocoon, beyond the mystical light of the moon. Above her the hillsides erupted in life, in springtime's riots of passion and strife, while Joe, below, in a dreamless state, slept beneath the topsoil's weight. She'd returned to the bliss of non-existence, free from the monotony of life's persistence. She'd returned anew to the ten thousand things, complete with antennae, six legs, and two wings. Her body felt agile, streamlined, and light. In fact, it felt perfectly formed for flight. She leapt from her chamber without a care, and for the first time she soared through the air. Her movement expressed the freedom she'd sought and everything else for which she'd fought. She zoomed through shadows cast by the trees, along with the orioles and hoopoos and bees. She whooshed with the winds outrageously fast, happily admiring the things she flew past until she passed by a ripe prickly pear whose spines reminded her of caterpillar hair. She then thought again of her friends far away, surely as one, and together they'd stay. With her newfound mastery of how to fly, she sat on a branch with a lonesome sigh. She had one problem, and one problem only. She had to admit she was still feeling lonely. The forest she'd found was perfect, she'd swear it, but might life be better with someone to share it. As her thoughts turned ever more bleak and stark, she saw something flicker somewhere in the dark. Just then she detected a harmony of tones, a glorious chorus of pheromones. The processionary moth landed beside Joe, quite charming from furry head to toe. Joe said hello and the moth replied hi, and together they fluttered off into the sky. When the bees begin busily buzzing next spring, while in the bower birds boisterously sing, you might think a cloud is stuck in a tree, blown in by a gentle breeze from the sea. <laughs>